All righty, well, good afternoon, folks. This is the uh, Load Balancing as a Service version 2.0 Liberty and Beyond talk. So if that's not what you're here for, you're in the wrong place. Um, to introduce people, we have uh, Franklin Naval and Brandon Logan from Rackspace and Michael Johnson from uh, HP. And I'm Stephen Blukoff from Blue Box. Uh, and if you haven't heard, uh, we are now an IBM company. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, well, well, no, I'm sure there'll be more. Don't worry. Okay, so we're going to talk here about, well, everything here. Anyway, so just as a quick explanation for those who have no idea what we're talking about up here, uh, load balancing is a vital component to cloud applications because it allows you to do uh, scale out as far as the ability to, oh, it's, it's pretty, anyway, sorry. Um, Basically, it allows you to have multiple machines in an application environment servicing the same IP address on the front end, same service on the front end. Um, it's the only way that you can actually get horizontal scalability out of um, a, uh, well, it's the best way to get horizontal scalability out of a uh, cloud application. Um, and it is a, so here we go, it's going a little quicker than I thought. Um, anyway, so. I don't need to t talk to you guys about why it's important, really. If you, if you don't know why load balancers are important, you uh, are in the wrong place as well. Anyway, so the, <laughs> the, the people that are involved with this, um, there's lots of people that are working on load balancers as a service. Um, at this time, most of them are from Rackspace and HP and, well, IBM. Um, anyway, moving on. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of this, and then we'll have these other guys. We'll tag team off in terms of telling you about where load balancer is. So, if you notice here, this picture is actually pretty special to me because this, this, uh, this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge as it was in the middle of the 20th century. And this is about 10 miles away from where I live. And the interesting thing about this bridge was um, if, you, if you didn't know what happened with it, after it was, uh, shortly, uh, shortly after it was built, um, they found that when there were high winds, the bridge started doing this sort of thing to the point where the, uh, it got a reputation for swinging in the wind. And, uh, and they started calling the bridge Galloping Gertie. Well, on one particularly nasty day, the, the, the oscillation went from this to this, and eventually the stress became too much for the bridge, and it broke right in the middle, and the result is what you see in this picture. Um, the important things to note about this is that it wasn't a construction problem or a usage problem. Um, mm -hmm. the, it was a well-built bridge, not much different than any of the other ones they had out in the day, that suspension bridge, and they weren't overloading it with anything. It was just that there was a serious design flaw with the bridge. And it, as a result, it's become an icon in all of engineering for bad design. So, now that I've fixed that in your mind, let's talk about Elbas version one. <laughs> okay, so Elbas version one. Um, it, it did actually provide a lot of really good things. Uh, specifically, it accomplished the task of providing load balancing. It's sort of important. Um, and you had a few features here that it did pretty well. Um, it does, it did, it, I should say it, it does still, because it's still there. Um, but we have uh, persistency, uh, cookie insertion, and a uh, driver interface for third-party drivers, so vendors who made load balancing appliances could plug into uh, Neutron LBAS and, and sell their stuff. Um, however, it had some serious problems. And all of them, when you look at these, they all boil down to the model. The model was the problem. Uh, in other words, it was a design flaw. So they weren't following industry standards when it came to uh, the terminology or concepts and used. For example, in LBAS version 1, there's this thing called a VIP. Well, when you use the word VIP in any other context in information technology anywhere else in the industry other than LBAS version 1, it has a specific meaning and people pretty much know what you mean. In Elbos version 1, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> and so, uh, because of this, um, we were barely able to deliver what we would call an industry feature set. You could do load balancing, but really not much more than just splitting traffic between various backend servers. Um, it wasn't following what other vendors were doing as well, as far as, as what, what load balancers are supposed to deliver. Um, there were improvements made to it, but all of those were, were difficult hacks. And so, from the inception of LBAS version 1, for two years, there were really no new features added. Um, again, people wrote them, but they were never incorporated because they were really dirty hacks, because you were, they were working around the problem. It wasn't the fault of the developers, it was the fault of the model that they started with. Um, and as a result of this, it was not scalable. In fact, nothing about it was scalable unless you 
uh, ripped out significant portions of it, wrote your own schedule, did whatever, um, and then you weren't really using LBAS version one anymore. You were using a, a hacked workaround. Um, <laughs> the problem with this, though, is that people actually started using it. So, um, <laughs> the, as I like to put it, the, uh, the ten end API was a dead end that was polluting user mind space because people were expecting load balancers to work like that, and they really shouldn't work like that. Um, and uh, on top of that, there were no uh, cloud operator controls. So that's the old and bad. And one of the things I want to make very clear to everyone here is that you should not be using LBAS version 1 anymore. It is now deprecated. So you should be using LBAS version 2. In fact, um, okay, oh yeah, right here. So this, by the way, this new bridge, this is actually the Tacoma Narrows bridge. This is, they rebuilt it, but they figured out what the design flaw was and corrected it. And you'll notice there's even like some of the struts here are, uh, are the same struts that were on the original Tacoma Narrows bridge. They reused the parts that made sense, but they replaced the parts that didn't. And uh, as an added bonus, they made it horizontally scalable. Um, so, LBAS version 1 versus LBAS version 2. So, this might look very, very subtle to you, where we've taken here that there's not a whole lot of difference between these two models, but what we've done is we've taken the VIP and we've split it out into a load balancer object, which contains the uh, IP address, and listener objects. And, you know, that might seem like a tiny little thing from the outset. If, you, if, if you've not worked with load balancers before, it seems pretty small, but it turns out it's, it's all the difference in the world. Uh, because of this, we can now more easily offer features like uh, transport uh, layer security. We have a way to plug it right into the listeners and to use, uh, make it, uh, you know, SNI, uh, use SNI um, compliance right out of the gate. Um, and, oh yeah, okay, we can go to this one. And, and anyway, these guys will talk more about what the other advanced features are that we're going to be adding with uh, LBAS version 2. And uh, so anyway, right now, these are the drivers that are available for the two versions, and they're not compatible. So if you are a vendor, and your name is in LBAS version 1, but not in LBAS version 2, you need to write an LBAS version 2 driver because it's, they're not compatible and we're not carrying it forward for you. So there you go. And from here, I'm going to hand it off yeah. to Brandon. Uh, I have no uh, special story about this picture. It's just the Liberty Bell. So, um, so what we've done in Liberty, uh, what we uh, released, um, so Neutron LBAS V2 um, is now not experimental. It's uh, part of the full release. Um, we did leverage the experimental tag um, before this so that we can make a backwards incompatible change, and that was on the listener's um, default TLS container. Uh, we changed that from ID to ref. Um, with that, the Neutron LBAS V1 is deprecated, as Stephen uh, just said. So, like I said, if uh, you're using V1 or plan on writing a driver, stop. Yeah, don't use it anymore. Yeah. Just don't touch it. Um, we, so one of the big things we did in uh, Liberty was we made Octavia the reference implementation. Before this, it was uh, the same uh, driver, the namespace uh, agent driver um, that V1 had. We just rewrote it for V2. Um, but now uh, we've replaced that with Octavia. That, that old namespace agent driver is still available uh, if you want to use it, um, but Octavia is going to be the reference implementation. And it took a lot of work to uh, get Octavia a feature parity uh, with that, so that's kind of what we focused on a lot uh, in Liberty, uh, but it fin we finally got it uh, done. Um, during that time, uh, we did actually do a lot of work on the V2 Horizon dashboard. Uh, because one thing that's missing with D2 is horizon integration. Um, that's going to be coming uh, in uh, Mataka, but uh, it didn't make the cut for Liberty. Same thing with L7 content switching. Um, it was a, a lot of work done, but it didn't make the cut. Uh, so I'm going to let Franklin t uh, talk about testing real quick, because that was a big uh, work done for Liberty. Yes, uh, so uh, we... Uh, started with a handful of tests, uh, starting in Kilo. Uh, most of it was unit tests and some Tempest tests. So uh, for Liberty, we expanded uh, on that with um, a uh, test plan. We had a hackathon, actually, at Rackspace, where we uh, created um, initial functional tests and uh, created a test strategy on top of uh, our initial work. and. We've iterated over that over several months uh, with several um, uh, companies. So, um, with uh, I'll go over uh, some of our functional tests. So, um, we have 100% positive API test coverage on uh, with uh, Dell Bass 2.0. Uh, we have substantial number of negative tests. Uh, so an example of a negative test would be um, passing in a, uh, an attribute 
such as a uh, foo um, um, for a protocol and expecting uh, yeah, so an invalid protocol for example would be a negative test would be a negative negative test for example for example yes um, and a positive test would be just creating a load balancer with uh, a valid name for example and we have uh, yeah several tests like that uh, so we expanded upon that by creating data driven tests uh, using test scenarios in Tempest and this allowed us to uh, have like s hundreds of permutations, um, especially around um, admin state up, these Boolean values that we would pass in for each of the entities. Um, this allowed us f uh, f uh, from creating 10,000 lines of code to like you know, a couple hundred. Um, and we were able to uncover like a uh, very, a lot of critical bugs from, from that, so. There's yes. still some more in there. So. Yeah, so there, there, there are. <laughs> Hence, um, here's a, one of the, well, I posted this, this code, but that's a truth table um, from one of our tests uh, around uh, Create Listener. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, we've been working on scenario tests. Uh, a scenario test, for example, would be creating, um, uh, well, this involved the whole, the whole stack. So everything from uh, Nova Glance uh, and uh, the networking part. So an example of a scenario test would be spinning up two, uh, two servers, uh, creating a load balancer, uh, passing in traffic via that load balancer, uh, verifying that the, um, the traffic gets load balanced between uh, the two nodes and verifying that uh, the algorithm is correct, uh, which was chosen. So um, right now we have uh, TLS tests in review as well as session persistence. So, uh, and we plan to expand more on that. So, um, I'll hand it back to Brad Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Yep. Um, so, what have we uh, got planned for Mataka? Uh, so, as I alluded to before, L7 content switching, a lot of the work has been done. Uh, <clears throat> one of the big, if you don't know what L7 content switching is, it's, uh, to put it simply, uh, it's a way to tell uh, the load balancer how to send traffic to many different pools based on the information that's in the traffic. So, for example, if you have a website uh, with a resource slash LBAS, say you want that to go to a different pool and the rest of the default traffic goes to a, another pool that's not slash LBAS in the URL. Or like slash images for like a static there content server yeah. or something like that can yeah. go to a static content pool yeah. and the rest can go to a so another thing uh, is pool sharing. This will actually help L7. Um, but currently, uh, without we don't have pool sharing. Uh, if you want to, say, have two listeners uh, go to the same pool, so traffic on port 80 and traffic on port 443 go to the same pool, you now have to create two different pools with the same information. Uh, this becomes a usability issue because whenever the, somebody wants to change the pool, change the member information, they have to do it in two places. So with pool sharing, uh, they would just create the pool once, um, and then they would just point, have a reference to that pool and point it to the, the other listener without creating it. And whenever they change the pool once, it changes it for both. Um, this also helps L7 um, content switching because the uh, content switching will go to a, a separate pool, and they kind of are independent pool. The pools are independent, so therefore you can uh, you, you can create a pool without a listener. The current model right now, a pool is tied yeah. hard to a listener, and, and this improvement is going to make it so that they're slightly detached to the point where it makes L7 way easier to do. I'm just yeah. saying. <laughs> uh, so another thing that we've been uh, wanting to do um, is a single API request to create a load balancer. Uh, right now, you have to go through these steps here, one, two, three, four. Uh, each one of them is a separate API request uh, to create a fully functioning load balancer that serves traffic and low bounces the traffic. So that seems a little cumbersome. Uh, it doesn't help. I mean, Horizon has to go through the same process. It, it's kind of a, it's like I said, it's cumbersome. Um, so with a single create API request, it takes an entire low balancer tree in one request, and it creates all the, uh, it sends it all to the driver, so you get all the network configuration up front, so the drivers can make more intelligent decisions about how to allocate resources. And as I said before, it's easier for Horizon. So the flavor framework for Neutron Advanced Services is not just an LBAS uh, thing, but uh, we're going to be utilizing it. <coughs> so the basic concept is operators can set us, uh, uh, define different tiers of load balancer types. 
for example, gold, silver, bronze. And they can point each one of those to a specific driver, like say a gold would be a hardware uh, implementation and a bronze would be uh, the namespace driver that we have. Yeah. Um, also, it can, uh, you can also split it up by different functionality uh, on the back end. So say you, your gold is also an HA and your bronze is a non-HA low balancer. Yep, I'll take it. All right. Um, if you remember back on the slide where we talked about the two different sets of drivers for V1 and V2, if you looked closely on the V2 side, you saw Octavia was in that list of drivers. So Octavia is a driver much like the vendor drivers. Uh, it plugs into uh, Neutron LBAS as a uh, back-end driver. So I'm going to talk through that architecture a little bit. Maybe. There we go. the slide advances. So up on the, the corner, you'll see we have Neutron and then uh, Neutron LBAS version 2. And there's an Octavia driver that plugs into that, that accepts your Neutron requests, your Neutron CLI or um, API requests, and passes those on to the Octavia API component. So each of the orange boxes that have a gear in them, those are actually processes that make up the Octavia driver. The control, controller. Well, yeah. Yes, anyway, sorry. Yeah. The controller <laughs> as part of the driver. <laughs> um, so as you can see, the uh, Octavia API uses Oslo messaging to send um, control, you know, create and update uh, commands into uh, what we call the Octavia controller. And that's the, the main pieces there across the top, the Octavia worker, health manager, and housekeeping. So uh, moving on, the, the Octavia worker is the component that actually does all of the um, automation and uh, provisioning of what we call Amphora. Uh, in the current implementation, our Amphora are service VMs, um, so they're booted via Nova, and that's where HAProxy and our actual load balancing occurs. Um, those Amphora are in cloud workloads. And so, as opposed to the old um, reference driver implementation, the namespace implementation, that was running HAProxy on your network nodes. Or I guess you could put it on your compute nodes as right. well, right? Most people didn't. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, we're booting up service VMs that uh, run HA proxy, and so basically you can scale that as you scale your compute environment. Moving across, the health manager, this component um, has two major functions. The first is it receives the heartbeat and status messages from those Amphora, and then based on that information, makes a determination if the M4 is healthy or not. And if the M4 has failed in any way, you know, HA proxy crashes or um, that M4 has completely disappeared, somebody did a Nova delete, <laughs> shouldn't have, um, we go into a failover. And so in this initial uh, reference implementation release, we have what we call hot spare failover. And so you can have a spares pool of M4 booted up, they just aren't configured. Um, sitting in your compute environment, and should one of the primary M4 fail, we will take that out of the spares pool, configure it, and bring back um, your load balancer into function. That process is a little lengthy. Um, it can be a minute you know, to get that configured and get all the networks plugged into that M4. And so um, I'll show you a demo here shortly where we're doing active standby, and that's a close to a second failover um, between M4. And this, this will, it hasn't landed in Liberty, but it will land probably in the next few weeks. Yeah, we're trying to hit Be in Mitaka, definitely. Yeah, Mitaka 1. Mm -hmm. um, going across again, so housekeeping manager. Uh, this is another process that kind of does background jobs uh, on behalf of Octavia. So uh, it does database cleanup. So when we delete load balancers, we keep those records for a short period of time. It's a configurable setting. Um, and then uh, we'll go through and do a cleanup process there. If you are using the spares pool, so if you've configured that to be more than zero, um, this is the process that actually goes to Nova and make sure those are booted up and running. And then coming uh, soon, uh, it will also do certificate rotation. So the M4, and I'll, I'll talk about that here in a minute with the M4 driver, has uh, two command and control uh, methods. One is a REST API that runs on the M4, and that has certificate protection. Um, so we do a two-way um, SSL validation on those Amphora. And so uh, coming in Mataka, we'll do automatic certificate rotation on the Amphora as part of that housekeeping process. So you'll notice in blue, we've got a number of drivers. This is one of the components of 
of Octavia is we've tried to make everything modular and uh, driver-based model so that people have flexibility to adapt it to their environment. Um, so right now, the controller worker driver uh, runs um, OpenStack task flow to do the provisioning. So it, it has all of the flows and sequences for booting up Nova, doing the network plugging, et cetera. Um, we actually have another controller worker driver in progress that uh, will help us work with con uh, containers. Okay. Uh, there's a, con a problem with containers right now. Uh, we do a lot of hot plugging of networks in Octavia. So when you add a new member um, to your backend pool for load balancing, if that member's on a different subnet, we will hot plug that other subnet into your load balancer as needed. But with containers, we can't do that hot plug. We actually have to um, create a new container and move to that to have all those additional networks available. So there is actually a, a, another controller worker driver in progress. So the controller worker driver has a number of drivers itself. One of those is the M4 driver I mentioned earlier. Um, there's an SSH driver, which controls the M4 via SSH. We're actually looking to deprecate that. Um, and then there's the REST API driver I mentioned. For certificates, uh, again, I mentioned. Uh, or In this case, it's TLS, TLS certificates. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we do TLS offloading in the Amphora. Uh, so we connect to Barbican as our secure store for those certificates and keys. Um, so there's a, a driver that interfaces to Barbican. We have a compute driver that interfaces to Nova. You know, so spin up those service VMs. Uh, again, as we go into containers, that may change to other implementations. It will. Yeah. yeah. And um, the network driver, which of course interfaces to Neutron for plugging our networks. So if you were in Vancouver, you saw this roadmap, almost um, identical. We've added, I think, one thing in the Metaka uh, time frame. But uh, we did release Octavia 0.5. It's on uh, PyPy. You can pip install Octavia now. Oh. And uh, we did reach our, our reference implementation feature parity. Uh, we do have the service uh, virtual machines and the spares pool failover capability. For 1.0, Mataka, we, we hope to meet Mataka yeah. with all these features. Um, many of these are already in progress. So active standby, again, um, is completely coded. It's up for review. We're working on bugs, and I'm going to demo that next. Uh, high availability control plane. This is having multiple controllers. Um, so right now, the current implementation uh, is set up for uh, one controller running that stack of software I just showed you. Uh, but we want to have that at high availability as well, where you'll have multiple controllers running in your different um, AZs or however you do uh, your HA. The layer seven rules we talked about earlier, uh, container support I mentioned as well is in progress. And then of course the flavor framework. Looking forward to 2.0, we also want to go one step farther. So we have the hot spare failover today. We're going to do active standby, which is a uh, second failover. Um, we're looking at active active. So that's having many M4 behind your load balancer, all able to handle your traffic. So being able to do horizontal scaling as well as your high availability. Yeah, horizontal scaling of the service delivery itself, of yep. the load balancing service delivery. Yeah. Yep. We have people working on that too. So it might actually land earlier than 2.0, but we'll yeah, see. Yeah, I don't know we'll who, see. who's I, working on yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, I have two demos I'm going to show you of active standby. The first one is um, just a pure round robin load balancer. Let's see, get that to go. So the first thing I'm going to do here is a Nova list. So I have two web servers booted up via Nova. Those are the back end, so that we can show that it's seven. doing something. Yeah. So the next thing we're going to do is curl those. You can see it responds. It gives its IP address and then a, a connection count. So you can see the first hits to those web servers are connection zero. Every 10 seconds. And as we go through the demo, you'll see those counters increment every time the connection's created. All right, so we're creating our load balancer. And we're uh, putting the VIP on the private subnet in this case. You can see it's in pending create state. So right now, uh, Octavia in the background is booting up that VM uh, via Nova, and we're uh, cycling on the API waiting for it to go active. At the bottom, you can notice the, the VIP IP address. We'll use that in a minute to actually hit this load balancer. And 
query those web servers. So as you can see, Nova does take a little bit of time. It's about uh, 40 seconds to boot up that service VM. That's one reason you might want to have a spares pool. Uh, it makes the provisioning much faster. All right, so uh, we're active. I, I did a load balancer list here, so we can see we've got uh, a VIP and it's active. In the upper box window, I've uh, started the backup script here. All that's doing is looking at the um, syslog on um, one of the two M4 we just booted in the active standby. So that's going to be the uh, standby M4 syslog. So what you'll see is when we do the failover, that's going to pop up a message and say, I am now master uh, in this environment. So we've created a pool now. And it's pure round robin. You'll notice the session persistence is blank here. So we're not doing session persistence for any incoming requests in this particular demo. So what we should see is the web server is alternating for each request. We're adding our first member. So that's the first back end web server. And we're adding the second one. In the upper box, you can see I've started the syslog on the master now. It's in master state. And it's waiting for me to hit a key to actually shut down that M4. So trigger the failure. OK, so I've started a curl in a loop here. You can see the connections alternating between the two web servers and the connection count incrementing. So now I'm going to hit Enter and stop that M4. If you blinked, you missed it. But we just failed over to the backup secondary M4. You'll notice that the connection sequences are still intact, and we're still alternating between those two back-end web servers. So that's how fast failover happens in active standby. The next demo, go ahead and move on. This one, we're adding session persistence. So failing over M4, that's great. That's not too hard. Everybody does that, right? But the trick is now we're persisting those connections such that the client always goes back to the same backend server. So in this case, I'm going to use um, source IP persistence. So um, you'll see down the bottom window, it's basically running the same script. The only difference is we're going to turn on session persistence. You'll see in the bottom window that when we go through the load balancer, it's always going to have the same web server responding because that's the same client always hitting it. We're maintaining that session persistence to the same backend web server. Um, so the same thing will happen here. We'll shut down the primary Amphora. It'll fail over, and you'll see that the session persistence is maintained um, for that client. They won't know that that failover occurred. They're still going to the same backend server. So once again, we're booting up the two M4A here as part of the load balancer create. Still takes a minute. Yep. Um, I will note, if you're doing this on DevStack or you're doing this in virtual machines, um, you do want to make sure that you have nested virtualization enabled. So you're exposing virtualization acceleration to your uh, environment that's running the controller. Um, because Nova, um, like in DevStack, uses QMU, and um, it will use TCG software emulation to boot that VM. And if you're running in that environment, it takes five to eight minutes to boot a VM with Nova on that hardware without the virtualization enabled. If you enable the virtualization, um, it's uh, under a minute to boot those VMs. So some people will see it takes a really long time for your M4 to come up. It's probably you don't have the nested virtualization enabled. OK, we've got our listener. So we're going to create a pool. And now you'll see we have session persistence enabled. We're not using a cookie here, but we're using source IP as our um, session persistence. And you want to watch here when it stops up in the upper right, how quickly it takes over here on the upper left. Yeah. And you'll see just a slight pause in that client um, request. So we've added our two members. Next thing we're going to do is start our query loop as our client. So again, we're using session persistence, so it's always going to the same back-end web server. I, I just killed stopped. the Amphora. And we failed go. over. And as you can see, the session persistence makes that client continue to go to the same back-end web server. 
So that's active standby. Again, we're going to try to make that land in M1, the TACO 1 milestone. So as I mentioned, you can run Octavio yourself um, in DevStack. Uh, you can also install Octavio from um, PyPy with pip. Um, you use the normal Neutron client to configure that and create those load balancers. Um, there's also a, a vagrant script in the samples uh, directory for DevStack there. Lots of pictures. I'll wait a minute before we go on to the next slide. <laughs> All right. So we are looking for contributors. We're looking for feedback. So please, if you're interested in load balancing or um, looking for a project to contribute to. Um, or if you want to see some of these features land more quickly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> throw engineers at us, please. So, uh, so we have an IRC channel on, on Freenode. There's people there um, pretty much all the time because there's some people that like to stay up late and work all night long. I get my best uh, we also have meetings on Wednesdays at um, uh, 8 p.m. UTC. Um, so you can join those, ask questions, um, see current status, etc. So now I'd like to introduce a new project um, that we're starting up called Cosmos. This is a collaboration between the Designate team and the uh, Neutron LBAS team. And this is global server load balancing. So this is kind of like load balancing your load balancers. Um, it'll set up a uh, DNS name that will direct incoming requests to multiple backend endpoints. And those endpoints could be at different data centers, um, could be different regions. And eventually, we'll add the capability to do geo um, routing for incoming requests. So if uh, a user from North America makes a request in, um, they would get directed to a data center in North America. Someone from Asia Pacific would go to an Asia Pacific data center. Unless that data center's down. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. that's, that's the key the piece point, of yeah. Cosmos is monitoring those endpoints and uh, uh, being able to direct the traffic appropriately. Right. So um, we're just spinning this up. We have specs out. There really isn't much code yet. Um, we're just getting started. But this is a, an architecture diagram I borrowed from Graham's uh, architecture document. Um, so we have an API, of course. Everything in OpenStack has an API. Uh, conductor, which um, manages our, our database access and um, incoming API requests. The Cosmos status check, this is one of the key pieces. This is the, the piece that goes out and monitors those back-end endpoints to determine which data centers are healthy and what their um, load levels are. <coughs> so in the initial release, down here at the bottom, you'll see endpoints. We're targeting LBAS version 2 to be that initial endpoint that we're going to support. And we can use the status API in LBAS v2 to see all the way down into that load balancer and even how many backend nodes are currently healthy. So we can make intelligent decisions about weighting a data center may more heavily than others uh, based on that information. So that's the, the key piece of that health check and making sure that we're sending traffic to healthy endpoints on the back end. The Cosmos engine is kind of that business logic. It's taking in that status information. It's taking in user requests and um, taking the appropriate action based on that, inserting or removing um, servers from DNS records. And then, of course, the GSLB appliance is the piece that's actually um, responding to user requests for those um, resources. And the initial reference implementation is going to be designated for that. We are also looking for contributors here. <laughs> um, we are just getting started. Um, we're a pretty small team at the moment. Um, so please, if you're interested in uh, global server load balancing, um, join us. Again, we have an IRC channel and uh, weekly meetings uh, that you can come and join and ask questions. So with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions you have from the audience. Got somebody raising their hand. Where's that? Oh. Start over here. It's a yes, no question. Uh, can you share those scripts? Thank you. Uh, my question is related to performance numbers, so maybe you have some gathered some performance statistics on comparing direct access to VM versus access via 
uh, HA, via your, sorry, H, sorry for HA proxy, <laughs> via a load balancing. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I can, I can, oh. yeah, too yeah. hot over there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can talk to that a little bit. I mean, performance numbers are really interesting, particularly when you have service VMs, because it's really dependent on the infrastructure that you're running, right? So what you're hosting those VMs in and the servers that underlie them. We did do a comparison from the namespace driver that we had previously as the reference in Octavia, and it was within a couple percent um, difference in number of connections per second that they could handle. It, so. it should be also noted, though, that even, you know, once we move to uh, basically when we can use containers as an infrastructure, we expect there to be essentially no difference between right. them. And uh, the added bonus that Activity gets you is this ability. Once once Active Active lands, you're going to be able to scale your service delivery horizontally. So at that point, um, it's going to far exceed anything the namespace driver could have done. Correct. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, you can scale better. Good question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have time, so go for it. Yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. I, so in the heat, uh, there is an autoscaling feature or something related to load balancing. Well, in, in those ages when we developed, sorry, I'm one of developers of this old bridge, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the, those times, we had some uh, um, uh, heat was able to configure its old load balancer to use for autoscaling and to use for as a pool of instances. How is it now? So is it able to use uh, this new load balancer version 2 to do the same? What about a this area? So yes. Well, actually, we have somebody from IBM who's working on updating heat support to use LBAS version 2. Yep. So that's work in progress. Li literally, I was looking at patches this morning. So it's, it's, it's very close. Any other questions? Is there a way to modify the traffic before sending it to the pool, for example? Um, so what you're talking about doing there is, uh, that, that would be part of layer seven. Uh, the layer seven support that we have right now is for context switching, so it doesn't actually modify the traffic. However, um, it is actually, nobody has really pushed hard for that, but it's the same line of, of thinking. So for example, if you wanted to insert a cookie or something like that at the load balancer layer to, before you shove it on the back end, um, if, if you want that done, uh, come to our meetings and, and, and say that that's a feature you want added because it's actually not much more work to do that once we have layer seven switching done. So right now, the, the short answer is no, we don't do that just because nobody's come to us ask for it. But we see it's, that's where it obviously will fit. Yeah, exactly. What about X4 to four headers? Is that? Oh yeah, so, yeah. okay, there's, there's some basic ones yeah. that do get added every time. Yeah. Um, that, if, for example, is the X forwarded for header, so you can tell, for example, what the client's real IP was, who was at, talking to the load bouncer. And uh, when TLS termination happens, I believe there's an X forward protocol or yeah, something like yeah. that, where it says, well, the, the client talked to us using HTTPS. So on the back end, even if you're talking, so you, when you do TLS termination, you have the choice of uh, terminating the, the TLS session with the client at the load balancer, and then you have the choice on the back end whether you want to talk HTTPS to the back end servers. Most people tend not to. They tend to talk to straight HTTP to the back end because they trust the internal network for some reason. Anyway, <laughs> um, but the idea there is your application still needs to know, was that, was that client request over a secure connection or not? And that's what you would look for in the header is, is the X forwarded protocol uh, header. Questions. Yes. <laughs> no problem. Oh, you can keep on asking. It's great. I don't <laughs> know when. We, when are we done here, anyway? Okay. Uh, so in uh, those ancient ages, so there were requir requirement for vendors to have uh, own CIs to run tests against their drivers. So is it the same for version two? And are you insisting on having these CIs for vendors just to make sure that the drivers work? Do you want to so talk about that? CI for the drivers? Yeah. Uh, we're not insisting on it, but it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm actually asking because uh, before Natron split out on these all the services, it was uh, like a requirement, like strict requirement. Yeah. But now it looks like uh, we've well, relaxed. You make, it. but you may yeah. not. We may get more strict about that as we go along. But yeah, that's. I mean, there's 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 voices that want to split drivers out from the <laughs> yeah. from the LBAS version two code tree entirely. Similar to Neutron splitting the plugins out. Yeah, so. yeah. exactly. And that's that. We're very likely we're going to push in that direction. So just be aware. 
That doesn't mean you can't have your third party CI and, and even get it to its voting, but you know, that's the. I don't know if it's very likely now. Yeah. After today. So. You push hard. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say that. All right. Thank you. We are out of time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>